Okay, we're ready. We're live now for our Bible study this evening. I'm Randy Stiber, the pastor of the North Canton, Ohio, Youngstown, Ohio, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Wheeling, West Virginia congregations of the United Church of God. I want to welcome you all to the Bible study. Those of you who live there don't need to know the, uh, the, the list, but if anybody else has found it and has added, you know, uh, chiming in tonight or is connecting in tonight and we want to at least know where we're, we're emanating from. We call it the Upper Ohio River Bible Study because um, starting with Wheeling and going up through Pittsburgh and then the drainage coming out of the North Canton which is near Akron area and the Youngstown area all drains into the Pittsburgh or sorry into the uh, Ohio River the upper end of it so we're the Upper, upper Ohio River Bible Study I guess you could say. Uh, but we want to thank you for joining us. The first thing we're going to do before we getting into, get into our Bible study, which is entitled Calling God's Apostles, Calling God's Apostles. Before we get into that, we want God's inspiration. So if you'll bow your heads, I'll go ahead and ask that blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of knowing your truth, uh, being called out of this world to understand your word, which didn't make sense before we began to know it, began, you began to open our minds, but it is makes perfect sense now, and this is the truth. We ask your guidance and blessing on our study, your inspiration on the teaching and on the listening, plus on the webcasting as well, so that all may be beneficial and edifying for everyone. We ask all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Calling God's Apostles. This is a, a fascinating topic, I think, for, for all of us. We, we go back and you wonder, well, how did the church organize? Uh, what was the leadership like? Uh, how, how did it get structured? You know, and this what we're going to do is look at a lot of those scriptures here, how Christ organized things from the very beginning. Then another time we'll get more into the church as it settled into congregations. But this really focuses on the front end of calling God's apostles. Uh, how did Jesus Christ decide to call the original 12 apostles? How did he decide? What were their backgrounds? Did they have special resumes? Were they the best speakers? Did they have the most scintillating personalities? Or was it just all je ne sais quoi? I promised, and that was the, the advertisement I sent out to our congregations uh, for uh, the Bible study, je ne sais quoi. Was it all just je ne sais quoi? Je ne sais quoi is French for I don't know what. Essentially translates from I don't know what. Je ne sais quoi. Well, we do know what, when we go into the Bible, we begin to understand why Christ called these men, and probably not totally thoroughly in every instance, but we, we do understand it, and it, it's truly fascinating when you begin to look at the, the human side of Christ and the human side of the church at that time, because, you know, that's what we are now. Uh, is we go back to our roots in this kind of a Bible study and begin to look at these. Um, I also added in our little blurb that we emailed out. It said, you will come away with a greater appreciation for the men who preached the gospel of the kingdom and served God and the brethren in the early years of the true church. And plus you'll find out what je ne sais quoi means. Um, let's look at the early church. The prophets of the Old Testament were each specially called by God in the Old Testament. Every prophet was spe specifically called by God. In the New Testament, the 12 apostles we're all specially chosen by Christ, therefore by God, in consultation with the Father. And after he was baptized by John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, you know, you give our, our timeline, because we do want to follow a timeline here. After he was baptized, when Christ was baptized, that is, and you think, well, why was Christ baptized? Did he have to repent of his sins? I thought he didn't sin. That's exactly right. He didn't sin. He was baptized, set an example for us that we should be baptized, and we have to repent first. Uh, because we do sin as human beings. He was infallible. We are fallible. But after he was baptized by John the Baptist, Jesus Christ fasted for 40 days and 40 nights during which time he faced down the devil's temptations. And you can read about that separate topic, but it's important for the introduction to this one. Then our Savior began to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God in the region where he grew up, in Galilee of the Gentiles. And you wonder, why is it called Galilee of the Gentiles? Well, the Gentiles used to live there. And after the ten tribes of Israel 
because that was the territory up by the Sea of Galilee, which is in the northern, northern part of uh, Israel even today. The Sea of Galilee is the Jordan River, it fills it. The Jordan River starts, I'll give you your geography lesson here. I thought I had a map, but I didn't, but I can describe it if you can think north at the top. North, at the north end of Israel, the, even of modern Israel today, is on the slopes of Mount Hermon, which is 9,350 feet, almost a 10,000 foot peak. Now, that's heavily snow covered in the winter time, and the Israelis go up there skiing. That's why there is a, an Israeli ski team in the Winter Olympics, because they have Arctic weather at the top end of the country. So that water drains down from the snowfall and comes out and you know, goes into the ground and comes out at the base of the mountain and forms small streams which converge very shortly south of it and become the Jordan River. Now that's north of the Sea of Galilee. It flows down into the Sea of Galilee at the north end, fills up that basin, and it's a strange basin, I'll explain that in a minute, but it fills the basin of the Sea of Galilee and then it empties out the Jordan River empties out at the other end, the south end, and it goes on down further south as far as Jerusalem, and then it empties into the Dead Sea. And then you want to know, where does it go? It goes straight up from the Dead Sea. Remember, it's dead because it's so full of minerals and salts, because the river feeds into it all these thousands of years, but it doesn't feed out, except through evaporation. So the H2O goes back up into the air, but the minerals all stay there, and it's so mineral loaded that it's, it's dead. It doesn't have life in it, although that's changed slightly in the past few years. They actually have some elements of some salt-resistant uh, salt fish that are living in parts of the Dead Sea. The most of it is, is heavy salt. There's your geography lesson. So Christ was at the top end initially in the territory of Galilee. That's where Nazareth was. That's where Jesus grew up. He was born in Bethlehem because his parents were down for the Feast of Tabernacles, but, and they had to escape to get away from Herod the Great, an evil king of the time. They escaped to Egypt, and then when God told them it was safe to go home, they went back up to, toward Galilee to Nazareth. And we'll get to that point and talk about Nazareth in, in just a minute. But let's look at the countdown to, uh, to Christ's ministry. As we, he, he grew up, you know, he was uh, about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He died when he was 33 because he, his ministry was about three years long. He was baptized. When it, the time came, he was baptized by John the Baptist. And you think, well, why was he baptized? He didn't have any sins to, for, you know, to be forgiven of. Exactly. He was baptized to be an example because he wanted his followers to be baptized too. The baptism is symbolic of washing away of our sins. There were many washings that the priesthood did at the temple that carried a similar symbolism. And so he was using that symbolism to establish you know, his messiahship uh, and then uh, his headship over the church of God that would grow from what he, what he started. Uh, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights after being baptized and he was tempted by Satan, and it was an intense spiritual battle that went on between the two of them, and Christ prevailed. He, the divine family, the Father and the Son, do not sin. Satan largely doesn't do anything but sin. Then our Savior began to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God in the region where he grew up. He went back to his homeland, in a sense, to start. And that would be in Galilee of the Gentiles, because, as I said, it had been populated by Gentiles before the Israelites moved in there. Now, we look at the countdown. The next point we want to focus on is sort of a countdown to Christ's ministry. He was baptized by John the Baptist, as we just said, tempted by the devil for the 40 days, began his Galilee ministry in Nazareth. Now, I'll talk about Nazareth's location in a minute, but it is up near the Sea of Galilee. We'll turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4 and verse 14 to 30. Luke 4 and verses 14 to 30 is our selection here. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. You know, after he had faced off uh, Satan and, uh, and rebuked him, cast him away from him, he came 
energized and ready to go with his ministry in Galilee. And news of him went throughout all the surrounding regions, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he had a reputation even before he started his ministry. Bear in mind, he was established as a carpenter, like his human father, stepfather, technically, in this case. He had a human mother, but he didn't have a human father. God was the father. Uh, so by, by his stepfather, Joseph, who was a carpenter. Sons typically, especially the eldest son, typically take on the trade of the father in, of, at the time. Not uncommon, perhaps, in, in some senses, even today in certain countries. So he went, came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. I think we probably read over this incident. It's kind of dramatic uh, at the very beginning of Christ's ministry. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He said, why was he going into the synagogue? The synagogues were the local church buildings of the Jews. The temple was in Jerusalem, and that's where the official worship uh, the sacrifices were all made there. They weren't made anywhere else because that's where the altar was. That's where the temple was. Uh, so that was the, uh, the religion of state as far as the, the representation of religion of the state. But the people learned in their neighborhoods. This has always been the case going back through ancient Israel further back than just the time of Christ, back at the time of the judges and so on. The Levites, certain numbers of the Levites were strategically scattered among the tribes. They all had to go into the temple uh, in Jerusalem to serve at the temple on their rotation. They had certain weeks they would be there each year. But otherwise, they were strategically sprinkled throughout the, the population. And you think, why was that? Well, because they were the teachers, and they were the doctors too. But they were the teachers. They were the ones who were schooled specifically in God's word so that they could teach others, but you needed to have that instruction down at the grassroots element of Israel. And they still didn't listen to it, unfortunately, for the Israelites. So i um, try to give you too much background. I won't get through all that I want to cover tonight. But it's still a very important background. He went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and that was, that was the teaching building uh, for the Sabbath, and where the priests or the, the Levites, it wouldn't necessarily be priests, but some priests would live near the temple. Others were scattered out into the territory too. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. Now, no, he stood up to read and that wasn't anything out of the ordinary. He probably had stood up to read many times. You know, at age 33, he'd been a man for 13 years or so. And so he would have had taken his turn. Responsible man, head and shoulders above everybody else in a certain sense. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, stood up to read, and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And then he had taken the, opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now verse 18 through 19 is what he quoted from the book of Isaiah. And it's actually from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me, to preach the gospel to the poor, he has anointed me, it is Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, especially the spiritually blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, especially spiritually oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's an auspicious section to take and then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him and so they were looking why did you read that and he said to them today this scripture that i just read this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing so all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. He must have gone on, maybe standing back up in some, uh, as we might say, it ad lib preaching, but it was inspired preaching. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Joseph was a carpenter. When did his son get an education? You know, there was a certain familial pride in that sense, a proper one. But then things turned ugly. And he said to them, 
He said to them after the conversation went along, so what we got are the high points of the conversation and the drama of the room. He said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. You're going to say this to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And then he said, assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is without honor in his own, except in his own country. But I will tell you truly, many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, Elijah the prophet, back at the time of the kings of Israel, this would have been in the 900s B.C., Yes, I think about the 900s B.C. When the heaven was shut up, no, not quite, yes, the 900s, eight 900s. When heaven was shut up for three years and six months, there was a massive drought. Remember that? During the time that Ahab was king of the northern kingdom of Israel, and Elijah was a prophet. And there was a great famine throughout all the land, but none of them, but to none of them, of the Israelites, was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow, and many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Now, the first one with Elijah is in 1 Kings 17. Make a note so you can read that later, just most of the, the whole chapter. And likewise, the second one, Elisha, where only Naaman the, prophet, the, Naaman the Syrian was healed of his leprosy. Uh, they, they performed various miracles, but they never healed any Israelite. And, and when Elijah was being hunted with a bounty on his head all over Israel, he went out north of the border, and there was a widow who had a little son, and he was a boarder there, rented a room at their place. And then the little boy died, and then God brought him back to life through Elijah's prayer. So that's 2 Kings 5 is Elisha, 2 King, 1 Kings 17 is Elijah. So he makes a reference. Now the note, note this, well I'll explain this in a minute. Let me go on. Let me tell you what the people did. So all those in the synagogue, this is primarily probably the men, when they heard these things were filled with wrath. Here they'd been marveling at the son of Joseph and how eloquent he was and, and his demeanor and everything. And suddenly... They're furious. All those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. They grabbed him and escorted him out of the city. And you think, well, are they going to throw him out the city gate? No, they led him to the brow of the hill, which was more or less a cliff, on which the city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. They were going to, they were going to kill Jesus Christ. This is how he started his ministry. I think we forget this detail. There was significant drama that Christ had to deal with. And then, passing through the midst of them, he went his way. And I don't know how he did that. Slipped loose, um, uh, whatever it might have been. He slipped between them, and they thought they had a hold of him, but they had a hold of each other. Uh, and before they realized what had happened, he disappeared. He'd gone away around a corner and disappeared, and they didn't get him. Christ was going to be executed right at the beginning of his ministry. And why? Why? Well, Cambridge uh, Bible for uh, Schools and Colleges has a commentary with it, and, and uh, he talk, it talks there about this. Uh, perhaps they were already offended, that is, the Jews in the synagogue, knowing that Jesus had spent two days at Sychar, which is among the hated Samaritans, which were, were uh, Gentiles. And now he who wished to treat uh, wished to treat as the carpenter and their equal was, as it were, asserting the superior claims of Gentiles and lepers, because Naaman the, the Syrian was a, he was a general, but he was a leper and he was healed of leprosy by Elisha later. So they were furious that he'd use these examples of Gentiles following God, being blessed by God, when he didn't champion the Israelites. So they were intensely political and angry with him. As it goes on in this commentary, truth embitters those to whom it does not enlighten. Truth embitters those to whom it does not enlighten. So Luther, uh, and they, they quote Martin Luther here, but occasionally he came out with something interesting. He referred to God's word is a sword, 
Well, we know that. It's the sword of the Spirit and the sword of God's Word. Is a sword, is a war, is a poison, is a scandal, is a stumbling block, is a ruin. And that's how mankind has tended to look at the Bible. Martin Luther was insightful in that particular instance. We've seen it happen since him. We see it happening even now. I mean, look at the riots that America has just endured. And the fury that the crowds have had against anything that had to do with the Judeo-Christian ethic. Anything. That's going to get worse. It was worth, this, this was crazy making here when Christ's ministry began. As we get closer and closer to his second coming, we're going to be seeing similar upsets. So he passed through the midst of them. You know, I don't know if it was a Jedi trick, as we sometimes refer to uh, something from Star Wars, uh, but whatever it was. Uh, further, in Clark's commentary, they said they were filled with wrath. They seem to have drawn the conclusion from what our Lord spoke, the Gentiles are more precious in the sight of God than the Jews, and to them his miracles of mercy and kindness uh, should be, shall be principally confined. They don't want the miracles to go to the Gentiles, at least this crowd of, of super conservative Jews in that sense didn't, and so they were willing to kill the messenger. I mean, on the spur of the moment. Talk about crowd mentality. Now Christ was comparing the Jews of his day to the Israelites of the days of Elijah and Elisha. That is not a favorable comparison, and they knew it. The Israelites, and especially the northern Israelites, it applied to the Jews as well, though, at the time, the northern Israelites were not obedient to God. Our challenge today as a part of the God's church is to react calmly and not in anger. React calmly and not in anger. In anger. But Compare this to how some have reacted to this epidemic, that COVID-19, that America is dealing with right now. Ridiculing it, uh, treatment or taking measures to protect others from it, uh, anger uh, about it, uh, all kinds of stories about how it's being used against the country. Instead of realizing, hold oh, it's an epidemic, people get sick, some of them die, we need to be careful, and uh, we do need to be careful. But we don't need to act like the Jews and Christ in the synagogue at Nazareth. So, obviously he was not wanted in Nazareth. Therefore, in verse 31, then he went down to Capernaum. And you think, down to Capernaum? A city, well, Capernaum is a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. They didn't want to be taught at Nazareth, so he moved to another town. From Nazareth in the mountains to the Capernaum in the valley, the valley we're talking about is where the Sea of Galilee is. That's a valley. It's got a kind of a round bottom to it, which is where the, what the sea kind of is, well, not quite round, more oblong, I suppose, but whatever the case, he had to go down to actually to the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum was where he was headed, that was where he actually owned a home, and so had split his time between Nazareth and Capernaum at, you know, part of his, his young, his adult life. So he went to Capernaum, city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. From Nazareth in the mountains to Capernaum in the valley is about 18 miles. And if you run, do your math, you can figure it out, that's about six kilometers. Uh... Nazareth's elevation was 1,400 feet. It wasn't a hard hike. <laughs> so he was uphill in Nazareth. He went downhill to uh, Capernaum. But Capernaum is 700 feet below sea level. Most of us in America don't realize that. We know the Dead Sea is under sea level. It's about 13 or 1,400 feet below sea level. But the Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below sea level. 700 feet. You would have, if that was in the ocean, you would have 700 feet of ocean at the surf, on top of the surface of the Sea of Galilee. So it's, it's far deeper than America's deepest spot, which is Death Valley. It's only 250 feet below sea level out in California. So we went down to Capernaum, and uh, that was about, uh, as I said, a, an 18-mile hike. And... Uh, 30 kilometers, I think I said 6. It was thirty, about 30 kilometers. 
Total, total elevation drop of 2,100 feet. So that gives you a sense of where he was. Whenever he went up to any of the cities in the hills, there was climbing. You went up. And you went up to Jerusalem, because if you're in the Sea of Galilee, the only place that you can't, you have to go down to is the Dead Sea. But if you're going to Jerusalem, you'll get into the trails that all go up until they finally get to Jerusalem. Christ began then to specifically call his 12 apostles. This is the beginning of his ministry. And that's what we're looking at, calling God's apostles. Matthew chapter 4 this time. Matthew chapter 4. And uh, we want to uh, start at verse 12, Matthew 4. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, that would be John the Baptist who was put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, apparently in haste, he came and dwelt at Capernaum. So we put, it, put all these together. You know, he came through Nazareth probably, but then he went on down to Capernaum and he stayed there. That's where Peter lived. Peter lived in Capernaum. Uh, Simon was actually his name. Peter is the nickname that Christ gave him. Uh, he came down to Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. That's, that was where the, t the tribes of Naphtali and the tribes of Zebulun had their territory bordering the Sea of Galilee. You go back to a map in the back of your Bible, you'll be able to see that. Now, they were, of course, long gone. The Jews lived there now, and some Gentiles, but uh, primarily the Jews, which was the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, and, part, and the tribe of Levi. Part of Benjamin, not all of Benjamin. So he dwelt in Capernaum by the sea, that it may, might be uh, fulfilled what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. And this is what Isaiah spoke. This is chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 of Isaiah. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region in the shadow of death, light has dawned. The darkness they were in was a spiritual darkness. Suddenly, Christ is there. He has gone active with his ministry. Light was shining. From that time, verse 17, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Kingdom of heaven is the same thing as the kingdom of God. Now, he shifted his base from Nazareth down to Capernaum, where he already had a place to live. Let's go to the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 4, verse 18 now. Just carry on. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, because it's starting to, he's going to begin calling his disciples, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, and they were fishermen. Probably they were using casting nets. I, uh, I've only had a chance to use that a couple of times. It's a lot of fun. It's a round net with weights all around the outside, and there's a draw cord that goes around the outside, and you throw it out into the water where you think the fish are and it sinks because of the, the weights on the outer edge. It sinks in a big circle and then you wait until you think you maybe have something and you yank the drawstring, it's wrapped to your wrist, and then you pull up whatever fish you have in it. Well, that's how they fished. They also used drag nets, uh, but they mostly did casting nets, especially in shallower water. So he... Uh, saw Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, and they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets, and they followed him. Why would they do that? Why would they immediately leave their nets and follow this guy that says, Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men? Only one reason. They knew him. They knew Jesus Christ. He was their friend. As I said, other sections shows that he actually had a dwelling there in that area of, Nat of Capernaum. So going on from there, he saw two, two other brothers, James, the son of De Zebedee, and John, his brother, who we know as James and John, the apostles, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called to them and immediately left, left their boat and their father and followed him. The fishers of men is fishermen, classic example of design sense of humor. But here we have the beginning, the calling of, of Peter and Andrew and James and John. That's four out of twelve. In verse chapter 8, he has a, a, a section here we want to look at, a verse or two, about the cost of discipleship, of being a disciple, what they were going to be, getting, be getting in for. This is Matthew 8, verse 18. Matthew 8, verse 18 to 22. And when Jesus saw the great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. And then a certain scribe came to him and said, Teacher, 
I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Christ's ministry was itinerant, was always on the go, rather nomadic, always moving. He had to cover the whole country. Later, the Twelve Apostles' ministries would be largely itinerant as well. But this one said, I'll follow you wherever you go. Obviously, he wasn't ready to follow him. Then another of his disciples said to him, and these aren't of the twelve, this is just other disciples, Lord, let me first, I will, I will follow you, but let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus answered him in this quixotic statement in verse 22, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Let the dead bury their dead? Couldn't he bury his father? Oh, you think, well, why couldn't he just, you know, wait, you know, and his father would die, and then he could come and be your disciple? Well, the question is, how old was his father? Fifty? Maybe, maybe fifty-five? Maybe he wasn't very old. Maybe he had a few, a decade and a half to go. So you, you've got to think in terms like that. Let me bury my father. Then, then it will be convenient for me, and I'll do it. The true gospel of the kingdom of God is an inconvenient gospel. God calls us, and we can see the relation today. We had lives, we were doing things, and then he called us to know his truth. And we had to decide to follow him. And it wasn't always convenient. And we made excuses just like these fellows did. But God doesn't want excuses. He wants wholehearted following. Christ is our master today, but we need to make sure that he is our master and that our master is not our career or business or, or our whim or politics or, you know, the crazy things of this world. Christ is our master. When he called his apostles, they understood that and they followed him, in most cases to the death. Now, turn to Mark, if you would, chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, verses, verse 16, we'll go all, all the way to 20. This is the calling of Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and James, and John from Mark's perspective. And he walked by the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. Okay, we got that one from before, too. And they were fishermen. And he said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. He got a little further. He had saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were all in the boat mending nets with their father. And he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, and followed him. The first four apostles were fishermen. Not the uber-wealthy, not celebrities, as I said before. Just productive, hard-working men. All four, you know, you think, well, was it just sort of a magic effect he had on them? No. These were men that he knew. He was 30 years old. They were about the same age. He'd grown up with them. It's only, you know, 18 miles from his birthplace in Nazareth down to where they lived. He undoubtedly was back and forth down through there in his growing up years. So there were background. These had background with Jesus, and that guided their decisions. Now, let's look how Levi was called. Matthew Levi. We call him Matthew because he wrote the book of Matthew, but his other name was Levi. He was also, so he was a Levite. Very safe to assume. Mark 2, verse 13. And he went out again by the sea, and it, it's to another little town that was just past Capernaum, uh, actually up where the Jordan River is coming right into the sea. It was right up in that territory or that ter uh, distance, just to several miles from uh, Capernaum. Well, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. So his ministry gained momentum quickly. He passed by. He saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax office. So he was a tax collector. Yes, the Romans would contract with accountants to collect the taxes for Rome. And then the, the tax collectors got their cut for doing that work. It was a client responsibility. Not uncommon, frankly, in lots of other nations. So Matthew Levi was a tax collector, hated by the Pharisees, of course. Uh, and he said to him, he said to Matthew Levi, he said, follow me. So he arose and followed him. And he just got up and left. Now, why would he do that? What kind of a weird guy would just get up and left when you say, follow me? 
if he's doing it out of the blue. Well, he wasn't doing it out of the blue. He knew this man. Obviously knew him very well. Probably known him all his life. Brothers in thought and fellowship, in that sense. Christ knew who he was going to pick. As the Father guided him, and as he ascertained even on his own reconnaissance. Now in verse 15, as it, as it happened, he was dining in Levi's house. So Levi sponsored a dinner, uh, since I'm going to be leaving the firm, so to speak. Uh, this is my farewell dinner in honor of my new boss, uh, who would be Jesus. And he was dining in Levi's house, and many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats with tax collectors and sinners? How dare he? We would describe the Pharisees as prima donnas. Now, they were bloodthirsty prima donnas at times, too. But they were prima donnas in, in this sense. It, it's, it's uh, you know, it, this is the typical pejorative of tax, tax collectors. But, you know, they considered it from a spiritual point of view, as the Pharisees had. And their viewpoint on what was spiritual wasn't very, very good. And they were probably the most informed of the various groups of Judea at the time. In verse 17, when Jesus heard it, he, he, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician. Now, obviously, you are all spiritually well. You're perfect. You don't need a physician. But those who are sick, they need a physician. R referring, in a sense, by analogy to what his ministry was. I did not come to call the righteous, but the unrighteous to repentance, or sinners to repentance. So you see here, the, the, there, that was a calculated insult to the Pharisees and what they were saying. You know, it's questionable whether they understood that insult. They, they blinded themselves with their, uh, you know, it was sort of an arch conservative viewpoint. You can be arch liberal, arch conservative, and you're just going to be as blind at, at one end of the spectrum as at the other end. Strange. Now let's go on to another item here in his ministry. We'll go to Mark chapter 3. Uh, starting in verse 13 through 19. This is where he ordained the twelve. So we'll see all the twelve's names in this paragraph. Starting in verse 13. And he, that's Jesus, went up on a mountain and he called to him uh, those he himself wanted. So he had many disciples, but he went up a mountain and he told certain ones, I want you to join me up there. Perhaps he did it quietly and they went up there. And they came to him all twelve, and he appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Now, he appointed twelve. That seems to say there may have been additional ones that came up there that he told to come up there too. There would have to be, because Matthias, who replaced Judas Iscariot after Judas, you know, sinned in, in the way that he did and committed suicide, Matthias had to be with them all the time. So you had the 12 apostles, and then there were a small cadre of other ones, which would have ended up undoubtedly uh, 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 serving in the ministry, uh, but the apostles being the primary ones. But they were also, therefore, the replacement for the apostle. So he appointed the 12 that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and to have power over power to heal sicknesses. So he gave them the power to heal people. And to cast out demons, and the demons were very active in Judea at the time. Simon, whom he gave the surname, or gave the name Peter. Peter means rock in Greek, or rocky. Uh, so Simon was, Peter went by his nickname Peter, which means rock. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, so James and John, uh, and to whom he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Yeah, maybe that was the way they spoke, and their personalities were thus forward. You, when you read the book of John, the, the books, the, the epistle of John, and or the, the gospel account of John, and then his epistles, and you wonder, well, it just doesn't seem like John was a son of thunder. But he was. He could write, too, but he, he, he was a son of thunder. Andrew, Andrew was Peter's brother. Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas. There are several other brother sets here that aren't identified in this particular passage. James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, 
Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, and they went into a house. So there we have the 12 apostles being chosen. He appointed 12. That, why 12? Well, there were 12 tribes of Israel. There are going to be 12 apostles. This is the artwork of God's plan. Certain numbers come up. Seven comes up often. Fifty comes up. That's the Jubilee year. Uh, various other numbers in particular, but seven and twelve and fifty are, are ones that we notably see. Uh, verse no, chapter 19 of Matthew says this. Chapter 19 of verse 28 of Matthew. So Jesus said to them, Surely, assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, the resurrection, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, as that will be, at the, after the resurrection, uh, after we're resurrected, that is, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones judging the tribes of Israel. So he, he appointed twelve, corresponding to the twelve tribes of Israel, because in the millennium they will be the kings of those tribes of Israel, or the judges, the kings, whatever the title will be, uh, it will be tantamount to that. Now let's go to Luke chapter 5. Here we see another aspect, uh, another re repeat of how he called the apostles and some of the events that are seen through Luke's research. Luke was a doctor, a physician, who was converted at, in the preaching of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, and then he traveled extensively with Paul, and he spent some time, obviously he was a writer, uh, and the doctors have to be meticulous writers, he did research, and he wrote the book of Acts, as well as Luke. There, there, it's a two-part piece that he wrote uh, on, at the request of perhaps some very wealthy church member. However it was, that's another story for another time. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. So it was, as the multitude pressed on him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake Gennesaret. And you think, okay, where's the lake Gennesaret? I only know the lake, the Sea of Galilee. Well, that's another name for it. Uh, the Sea of Galilee, the Lake Gennesaret, and uh, I think it's also called the Sea of Tiberias. Now, that's the Romans did that. We don't pay any attention to that one. But Gennesaret and Galilee are the two that we know it by primarily. So he stood by the lake, and it, you know, it comes down. As I said, you're going downhill to get to it, and you're 700 feet below sea level when you get to the surface of the Sea of Galilee. So you're going to have some slopes that go up, a little bit of flat area, but mostly then it slopes up. So you've got territory that slopes. And it just, it's just an interesting picture here of Christ's ministry getting underway in his preaching. Um, and he saw two boats standing by the lake with the fishermen and got out of them and wa were washing their nets. So he got into one of the boats, which happened to be Simon's, Peter's, and he asked him to put out a little from the land. And then he sat down and taught the multitudes by the, by the boat. See, the, the multitude pressed about him to hear God's word. They were hungry for what he had to say. But they were squeezing around where he couldn't talk to them. You know, the shoreline, if he stood down near the water's edge and everybody stayed up the slope, then the shoreline created an amphitheater which his voice would carry to more of the people. But crowding down the slope ruined the amphitheater effect. Standing in the boat, or sitting in the boat, a, a, a little offshore, restored the amphitheater, plus it magnified his voice slightly by bouncing it off the water. And it actually works that way. So when he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, so he, he gave a teaching session, a, perhaps a long one, we don't know, uh, but it was a satisfactory one, and then people went their way for their dinners or whatever. And when he finished speaking, he told Simon, he said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Peter Simon said, Master, we have toiled all night and we caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled their partners. Notice this. Peter and Andrew signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled the boat, both boats that, so that they began to sink. And Peter saw it and fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter was a fisherman, an expert fisherman, but he'd never seen a fisherman like Jesus Christ. 
For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. So that's the other boat that came to help pull in the net, take in the catch. And that was a blessing for them. And Jesus said to Simon, and this is an important, this is the big setup for this statement he's going to make. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Catching fish today, but from now on, you will catch men. In other words, I will call men through your, your preaching when you are mature. So they brought their boats to the land, and they forsook all and followed him. The sons of Zebedee turned their boat over to Zebedee. Peter and Andrew turned their boat over to whoever they had to turn it over to, maybe another relative, and they followed Christ. They were dedicated disciples. Then it became, then it became apostles. Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6, verse 12 to 16 of Luke chapter 6. We're getting into the choosing of another account of it. In those days he went up to a mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve whom he named disciples. And there you have the list again. I won't go through the list, but you have the list. So he prayed all night. Before it said he went up into the mountain, and then they came up, and then he told them which one would be the apostles. The apostles would be his messengers. They would be the primary ones that he would train. They, in turn, later would train many others. Uh, he had secondary level of training, those who were on the outer edge of the circle and still hearing his voice. So, you know, there were a good number of future brethren and elders that were being trained personally by Christ. But the twelve got the primary teaching and the most time. Acts chapter 9. We're going to look at the calling of the 13th apostle as we wind this up. The calling of the 13th. We think, well, I thought there was just 12. No, there's a 13th one. One who was called out of time. You know who he is. Now, there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. He's not the one, though. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias. Ananias lived in Damascus, which is right where Damascus is now, is where it was then too. So in a vision he had seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him and so that he might receive his sight. He's blind. So Ananias answered and said, Lord, um, this is a few years later after the church has begun. So the 12 apostles had their training period. Judas Iscariot committed suicide and was replaced prior to Pentecost by Matthias. And then they were busy preaching all around the territory of what we call the nation of Israel today. And at that time it was Palestine, the Romans called it Palestine. So Ananias said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man and how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. You can read about that in Acts 7 if you want to read a sad story, but a very enlightening one. Stephen was a deacon, Acts chapter 6, he was ordained. In Acts chapter 7, he's obviously headed for the preaching ministry because he is speaking. He's very, uh, very articulate. Chapter 7 is a masterpiece of uh, uh, admonition from Scripture. But who was it that ended, st st ended his life, ended Stephen's life? It was Paul of Tarsus, a Pharisee, a fire-breathing Pharisee. How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Paul terrorized the church in the Jerusalem and Judea area, terrorized people, arresting men and women at night and dragging them from their homes, leaving their children to who knows whom. And he, he was a terror to the church. <clears throat> and you want me to go and see him? He just wanted to make sure that he was hearing right. And God said... Uh, answered him, go, 
for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Paul was called to be an apostle. Ultimately, he was the apostle who oversaw the preaching work of the church to the Gentile territories, Romans and Greeks and so on. Peter oversaw the work of the 12 apostles, including himself, going to where the Israelites were settled in that first century AD. Not just the Jews, but the other tribes too, because they were in different places within reach of the, the nation of Israel or nation of Palestine. They were in reach of, reach of those from India up to, uh, the, clear to the north, up to Scythia, which was north of the Black Sea, and far to the east as well. It's another story for another time, but that was Peter's responsibility. Paul would look after the Mediterranean coastlines where primarily there were Gentile converts being called. Paul was an apostle born out of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 explains that. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand. The gospel. What's, which gospel do we stand in today? The answer is exactly the same gospel. The gospel of the kingdom of God. Straight from the scripture. It hasn't changed. Who cares about political winds that blow back and forth? The truth of God does not change. The gospel has not changed. It's the same message. We need to remember that. By which... That gospel, you also were, are, are saved, or being saved, and if you hold fast that word which is preached to you, thus you're being saved, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, so he's rehearsing the essence of what his preaching has been, and he was buried, and he rose the third day. You have to have the Messiah, because he's the head of the church. And you say, well, what about Christ? Christ means Messiah. It's just a Greek word for Messiah. And he, has, he was seen by Cephas, that's a, the Greek name for Peter, and then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present time, but some have fallen asleep, they've died. After that he was seen by James, that would be James, the brother of Christ, the James who wrote the book of James, not the James, the brother of John, because he was executed in chapter 12 of Acts. He was the first of the 12 apostles to die. He was seen by James and then by all the apostles, and, and last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of time. I am the least of the apostles, but Paul recognized he was an apostle, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, we preach, and so you believed. The apostle born out of time. Now how do we apply this lesson? This is a brief, brief ending. I won't take too much time in this, but a little bit. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Now, 1 to 16. We're not going to go all the way to 16. We'll go through the first part of it. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 1. I, therefore, prisoner of the Lord, Paul is writing. Paul wrote the, the, the uh, epistle to, to the uh, Ephesus, to the Ephesians. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Walk worthy of it. Be faithful. Do what God commands you to do. And with all lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering, no arrogance, please. Be humble. Be teachable. Be dedicated. And be fearless in that sense, too. With all gentleness and long-suffering and bearing with one another in love. Sometimes we have to bear with one another. Thankfully. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit. We all have the same Spirit of God. That's what He's given us when we repented and were baptized. But we have to keep it in a bond of peace, not in arguments and splits and divisions. That's not healthy. And where there have been splits and divisions, you have to build bridges back. You know, the church has faced that all through the centuries down to our time. There is one body. 
one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each of us, to each one of us, grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And there we get the magic word grace again, which is thoroughly misunderstood by traditional Christianity. Uh, it is a, it's referring to a gift. There were certain gifts that God gave. Paul had the gift of, <laughs> of uh, debate. He was marvelous at it. It usually caused a riot, but it also caused conversions. And he had a gift of teaching pastors because we, we have the evidence of that in Scripture. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. God has given us gifts. Now, these aren't, you know, gifts that we necessarily decide what they are. As people run around, what's my gift? Well, just follow God and you'll know what it is. Mostly, it's a gift of his forgiveness that we are chosen to be a part of his church, part of the the mechanism, the organizational mechanisms together that preach the gospel of the kingdom of God in our age. It's marvelous. You know, calling God's apostles and <laughs> then reaches down calling God's brethren. Those of us who aren't apostles, uh, some in the ministry, but the bulk in the membership, but all faithful and dedicated one as the other. God has called, called his apostles to be taught by Christ personally or by his word later. Uh, and Mr. Armstrong used to talk about that, how he was taught by God's word, his Bible, to do God's work. They were called to do that, to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God of the world as a witness before the end comes. And we as the members of the body of Christ pitch in and help with that. We back that up. We support that to build the church of God. And the church has built and shrunk and built and shrunk. So there's always some building to be done. To teach and express the love of God. That was another part of the calling of the apostles. To spiritually energize the ministry and the brethren and thus build the church, not only in numbers, but in spiritual dedication. And to be ready for the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now God has called us to weather the spiritual storms and endure to the end while helping promote the true gospel of the kingdom of God. That's how it applies to us all the way. 2,000 years down the line, here we see how God has called his apostles and realize that we are, in a sense, historically, a part of that calling in the sense that we're in the church now and it's our turn to back up the work that God is doing through those he is using to preach the gospel to the world as a witness. Well, I hope you found this interesting, calling God's apostles, how God called these men, how he has called then the brethren who back them up down through the ages. We haven't gone through that history, but that is, it's sometimes it's sad. It's always glorious, though, because it is God's church down through time. We're part of God's church now. You've got to believe that. You've got to prove that this is truly the church of God, to really truly believe it and to understand that not only is God calling his apostles and has called his apostles, but he's calling you and I to be faithful members and dedicated servants of Jesus Christ, our Savior. I want to thank you for joining us for the Bible study. We look forward to having you with us the next time. Um, we send out an email to let you know when it is. And if you do have Bible questions, send them to questions at ucg uh, ucgnorthcanton.org. Uh, and uh, we'll put them in the, the hopper for our next Bible study, Question Bible Study. Well, that's it for tonight. We want to thank you for joining us, and we'll talk to you later. Goodbye.